Thank you for turning to Tim from NBC 10 News and the American Democracy Project at Rhode Island College. This is a Decision 2023 debate, the special election for U.S. Congress. Welcome to the second of two NBC 10 debates being held among the Democratic candidates who are vying for the seat in Rhode Island's first congressional district. This is the race to replace David Cicilline to represent Rhode Island's first congressional district in Washington. I'm Brian Crandall. I'll be your moderator. There are 11 Democratic candidates who are on the ballot and still in the race with so many candidates. We've decided to split them into two debates. The first among six candidates was held yesterday. Here on stage for our second debate, we'll start left to right with Lieutenant Governor Sabina Matos. Spencer Dickinson, a former state representative, uh, Gabe Amo, who recently left service as an aide in the White House, Providence City Councilman John Gonzalez, and former Naval Intelligence Officer Walter Burbrick. Welcome to all of you here in our debate. We're going to ask you each questions. Uh, the general format is we'll give you 45 seconds to give an initial answer, but then we'll come back and open it up for discussion and debate. Uh, our first question on the economy. If inflation has slowed, uh, but a Pew Research poll earlier this summer showed that uh, it's still a major issue with voters and that actually more voters uh, consider Republicans to be a better option when handling the economy. So the simple question to each of you is, what would you do to help the average Rhode Islander, especially in the first congressional district, if you go to Congress? We'll start left to right with Lieutenant Governor Matos. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. It's, I just was speaking with voters yesterday in Woonsocket and they're complaining about the cost of housing. It's the number one thing that they're telling me that is um, bothering their, um, it's making it really hard for them to, to be able to afford paying the rent and also buying food and paying for medications. So one of the things that we have to do is to make sure that we protect Social Security and Medicare because those um, voters that I was speaking with are depending on Social Security in, in order to be able to meet that need and to be able to pay the rent, buy food and buy medication. Welcome back to you. Mr. Dickinson, how would you address the economy? Uh, I think we ought to look at some of the root causes. Uh, there was a great economist named Keynes who figured out that you could level out the economy if you borrowed some money and built roads or did public works projects. He was right, but unfortunately the Democratic Party, which is the party that I've been in for many, many years, uh, doesn't completely understand this. And in order to save the party, which I think is part of what we're trying to do here, uh, we need to understand that you've got to stop once in a while and pay off those loans. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And the consequence is what the lieutenant governor was just talking about. People are suffering from inflation. I think the, the remedy is we've got to get through this, but let's not do it again. My guess is we're probably going to do it again. Mr. Amo. Yes, I think especially here in the 1st Congressional District, we need to do our best to protect our seniors uh, and invest in Social Security and Medicare, specifically on the topic of Social Security, strengthening it, making sure that we are uh, adding the, the cost of living adjustments that are necessary so that uh, our seniors who are facing increased housing uh, insecurity, who are facing challenges with their pharmaceutical drugs and who are having real challenges are able to thrive and that based on how this district looks is really important as we uh, invest in our economy and protect people. Councilman Gonzalez. Someone who grew up in poverty, I understand better than anybody on this stage the challenges that people are facing out there. The cost of living is a serious, serious issue that we need to address at the federal level. Like some of my colleagues here, I agree, we need to address Social Security, but we can't just keep the status quo on Social Security. It's why at the federal level I support the Social Security Expansion Act, which would expand uh, Social Security benefits to our seniors, but also the Paycheck Fairness Act, which is something at the congressional level that I would support to raise wages. We need to make sure that we're investing in jobs and education that put people first, and that's exactly what I would do in Congress. Mr. Berwick. Yeah, my, my number one priority uh, in Congress is to uh, lower costs for hardworking families and to build a strong middle class, and I think we can do that in a number of different ways. Number one, we, can, we need to tackle inflation. Uh, we need to uh, provide access to capital so Rhode Islanders can start, grow, and leverage their own small businesses, remove red tape. Uh, but we also need to, to push federal dollars down to the local level so we can rebuild our aging infrastructure. Uh, so, and we really need to invest significantly in workforce development so that we can build the next generation submarine, the next generation windmill, and possibly even the next generation semiconductor right here in Rhode Island. So Mr. Dickinson says there's too much spending. Mr. Amo, you came from the White House and the Biden administration and people on the other side of the issue blame 
the, the stimulus money and all the spending as a result of COVID, did the Biden administration and the federal government overheat the economy? And that's why we are where we are now. I'm so proud to have worked for the president at the White House uh, amidst a global economic uh, crisis, uh, a COVID-19 pandemic that we're recovering from, and the historic investments that I helped with for states and cities across the country were additive, helping communities right here in Rhode Island with the American Rescue P Plan, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, and the Inflation Reduction Act. So no, but I don't had, think uh, that... It has uh, had the consequence of now high prices, high interest rates, harder for people to borrow, and people finding themselves unable to pay certain bills. Councilman Gonzalez. So one of the things that differentiates me on this stage is that I've actually been putting those dollars to work. I represent the east side and downtown in the city of Providence. The city of Providence received over $166 million in federal funding to address things like housing and homelessness. We have a $29 million line item. And here's the difference. I've been on the ground doing the work, not only as a teacher, but as a city councilman. So I'm gonna be ready on day one. And I'll also say that because of that experience, an experience as a legislator, which with all due respect, my colleague to my right does not have experience as a legislator or experience as an elected official, we're gonna make sure that we leverage as much federal funding to Rhode Island to lower the cost of living for folks here in our state. Lieutenant Governor Matos, you're in the, the state administration putting some of those dollars to use. Was there too much money pumped into the economy uh, that had potentially unintended consequences, and now people are struggling to pay the bills. No, that's not the problem. That money was needed in the economy to make sure that we provide for those people that had been suffering, that had no resources, no income. This money was well used. And here in Rhode Island, we, for the first time, we dedicated a quarter of a billion dollars for housing, which is one of the number one complaints that I hear people are suffering from is the cost of housing. If the result is to now raise interest rates yet again, which has been the pattern here now for the past couple of years, the highest in 20 years, are you okay with that? To raise the interest? No, again. we shouldn't raise it again. Mr. Berbrick, no. are you okay raising interest rates again? No, look, I mean, Rhode Island families are, are hurting and we're struggling. And, you know, one of the biggest barriers to economic growth is, is the housing crisis that we have. Uh, we need more housing for seniors, more housing for veterans, more housing for uh, our young folks who are graduating from college or now moving back into their family's basement because they can't afford uh, their mortgage or rent. I mean, almost 50% 50, 50 of Rhode Islanders uh, paychecks are, are going to, to mortgage and, and so we've got to unlock number one we've got to unlock innovation and we've got to start earning more than we spend I mean how many middle-class families and small businesses you know spend more than they earn and so we've got to do a better job unlocking innovation here M Mr. Berbrick uh, made the argument you know spend more on infrastructure and road repairs that that creates jobs Mr. Dixon you said too much you spending, know, this so no is, uh, this is the opportunity I've been looking for everybody says you got to differentiate yourself the four other candidates here have all said, they've all talked about spending money. What I'm saying is you can spend all you want. And I've been involved in state budgets for 12 terms as a legislator, I understand. And Rhode Island can be proud of its programs. But the point is, if you're spending money and you're not taxing people for it, you're lying to the people because you're going to tax them later with inflation. And there's no way to get around that interest rate. Where do you cut? Where do you cut? Where, where, where would you cut? How about, why don't we just start with telling the the uh, voters the truth. And the Inflation Reduction Act, look it up, there's nothing in there about inflation reduction. Le the title is a lie. Lieutenant and Governor, where do you, doing where do you that, cut? The system's not gonna work. Where do you so cut if you have to what cut? What we have to do is to make sure that the one percenters are paying their fair share of taxes. And we have to make sure that the corporations have stopped getting loopholes to get away from not paying taxes. That's how we can get the funding that we need to cover those services. Councilman, say that you raise taxes on the wealthy, 400,000 has been kind of the benchmark. Do you raise taxes? Do you cut from defense? Where do you go? Let, let's be honest here. The millionaires and billionaires that are rigging this political system are getting tax breaks while the rest of us, especially working class families, are suffering. My whole career, I've been about tax fairness. It's why that in, on the east side of Providence, we've worked really hard to hold our large tax exempt institutions like my alma mater accountable for paying more of their fair share. The seniors who live in my community who are elderly on a fixed income, they can't afford to pay more in things like property taxes. We need to stand up to corporations. And we need to stand up to millionaires and billionaires that aren't paying their fair share. Mr. Amo, tax, tax the rich 
cut from the defense, cut, cut aid to Ukraine? Where do you go? I, I, I look, we have to look at our, the corporations and the rates that they're paying and making sure that the Amazons of the world are not paying zero dollars in, in, in taxes. We need uh, to ensure real fairness across the corporate structure. Rhode Island is a land of small businesses, and a lot of those small businesses uh, are struggling. Uh, and in, in large part, it's because we have an unfair uh, playing field for them in our economy. It's combined with making sure that the wealthy pay their fair share, that's where we can truly drive the investments we need in this economy. All right, moving to the next question. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Matos, you were the focus of certainly an intense amount of scrutiny uh, just a short time ago earlier in this campaign after nomination signatures submitted on your behalf uh, included the names of some dead people and others that were uh, suspected of being fake or fraudulent leading to an investigation by the Attorney General's office. Uh, you've blamed a woman, a contractor you hired to collect signatures. A New York Congressman who came to town to support you claimed this, that you were the victim of discrimination here and that this was unfair. Do you believe that this situation is unfair and you are the victim of discrimination? What I believe is that I have been the most better candidate in this stage. No one else, and even in your, uh, in your previous panel, no one else has been better as much as, as my campaign has been. I have been, but this but, is the way how it has been for me in public service. Since I ran but, for office the first time, I have always been the most better candidate, but, but I go get the work done and deliver for the people that but, I represent. But vetting is different than an issue that comes across in the campaign. Is this um, sloppy campaign management? Uh, is this a lack of oversight or was it unfair? Uh, we'll go to you, Mr. Burbrick. Yeah, you know, I've, I've actually been pretty vocal uh, about this. You know, as a, as a naval intelligence officer, as a civil servant at the federal level the last 15 years serving at the State Department, at the Pentagon, at the Naval War College with the highest levels, uh, high, highest uh, clearance levels, um, you know, it's about integrity and it's about accountability. And I think, you know, the, the lieutenant governor, governor had an opportunity. Uh, it took about a week to, to confront Rhode Islanders. Uh, but rather than placing the blame uh, on someone else, as a, as a leader, you've got to hold your, your, your team accountable, but you gotta be willing to take responsibility if, if there's a mistake. Mr. Gonzalez, we'll get back to the thing. Accountability is incredibly important here. And I just wanna remind folks that we need to protect our democracy from assault. And this undermines our electoral process. But I would say, let's be frank, candidates of color like myself have a significantly uh, harder uh, chance in running for office because of the big money in politics. I'm proud of the fact that we've raised over $200,000 in the course of this campaign, small grassroots contributions from people all across the state. But I think this is an important distinction because there are so many people out there who want Congress to work for them. And right now, there's a lot of big money pouring into this race outside uh, the, special interest money. And I think we'll there are a lot of folks on the stage Mr. Amo, who are beneficiaries I'm, You had been that. critical as well of the lieutenant governor on, on the situation with the signatures. Uh, do, do you think perhaps the, the, some of the criticism was unfair that this could have happened to any of y'all? Well, look, I, I think that we have litigated this uh, at length. Uh, I spoke on this issue, most certainly. And ultimately, people are voting right now. People are voting uh, on election day. And I think it's time that we refocus on the priorities of people across the first congressional district. But do you think it changed the race and kind of how the, the, I, the race I'm, was shaped? I'm certain it, it had an impact, but, but ultimately we have to focus on what this job is going to be about. And that's about serving Rhode Islanders. And that, Mi that should be the priority. Mr. Dickinson? Well, when you get elected to Congress, you hire your own uh, co congressional staff, and then you also hire generals and ambassadors and uh, members of the, uh, well, you do, you gotta, you gotta approve them. Well, the Senate and You gotta confirms. pay attention who gets appointed to those jobs. And it's all about knowing who you're talking to, knowing who you hire, knowing whose paycheck you're signing. And if somebody messes up on your watch, take responsibility for it. Lieutenant Governor. Um, I did take responsibility, but I wanna ask all but of my- you've taken responsibility, I, but I, you've also said I, that you've been vetted. But I've been better more than anyone in here. And the most important thing is the Board of Election confirmed what I have said and what the Secretary of State have said already, that I have way more than enough signatures to qualify to be on the ballot. Now, I want to ask if any of them can raise their hands if they didn't have any signatures disqualified. But the, I think we've, we've been any, through this. There's de the names of dead people and those that are, uh, lots of candidates have signatures that are invalidated because somebody lives out of the district or a signature doesn't match. But, but has Ryan, been, that's been, go ahead, Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Crandall, look, this has been a big distraction throughout the entire campaign. 
People want to focus on the issues. We're tired of these damn signatures. We want to make sure that we can focus on the issues, and that's what Rhode Islanders deserve. I agree with Mr. Gonsalf on that. Actually, when I'm, I'm out and about, that's what these people are talking to me about, is actually they care about Social Security, Medicare, about housing, about who's going to be the so, voice for abortion rights, for women's rights, who's going to be the voice for gun safety legislation. That's what voters want to talk about. Uh, when I mentioned that it may have changed the race, I mean, the Providence Journal is now calling Aaron Regenberg the front runner. He's not here. He was in our previous debate. And that you were the perceived front runner before. Does that bother you at all that, that, that maybe this issue became such an issue in the race? There's nothing, as, as you can see, I cannot control what is covered in the media. All I can do is do my job. And my job is to make sure that I represent the people of Rhode Island, that I do it the best way I can. I've been working for 12 years, for 12 years as an elected official, never had any incidents. You can see my record. I have a record of getting things done, delivering at the, at the local level. Look at my neighborhood of Oneville, the changes that had happened. Look at the work that I did in the Providence City Council, supporting workers' rights, supporting legislations that are helping the people of Rhode Island. We'll finish That's up there, me. kind of a follow-up here. Uh, you know, I mentioned that there was the claim of whether or not you were discriminated against. There's been an issue in this race too. And again, I'll refer to Mr. Regenberg, uh, people upset that he got in the race as a white man and um, potentially taking uh, some thunder away from progressive women of color in this race. So race and gender have kind of played a role in this uh, campaign already. Uh, Mr. Burbrook, what do you think about that? Do you think that, um, that a person who's not of color can effectively serve this district as well? Absolutely. You know, I, I want to, I want to uh, return back to something that John said, though, and that's uh, the system. And I think this is a, a big flaw in our system, that our system uh, are, is built for the wealthy and for the politically connected, right? And I think, you know, I, I'm proud of the fact, uh, like John, that, you know, we raised our money grassroots. Uh, but, you know, in the, yeah. in, the case of, in the case of Gabe, Sabina, and Aaron, you know, there are independent expenditures and dark money coming from D.C. that is coming to help support their but, but campaign. But is that just what happens when you're a front runner and a leading no, candidate? No. I, I don't think that's the case. That you, that I think you get more money. No. Mr. Gonzo. No, so I, I think that it comes down to the money that you're willing to accept. So we started at the beginning of this campaign with a pledge to say we're not going to accept any fossil fuel money. We're not ex accepting any corporate PAC money. We're not accept accepting any super PAC money. The reason why we made that pledge is because we want to be beholden to the people that we represent and no one else. And I think that's an so, important distinction. There's a lot of people on this stage who are so accepting have you, lots have you and turned lots money of down? money. Have you turned any money down? Have we turned money down? Absolutely. Mr. So, it, it, well, the reason is, is because this is about putting people first. So again, if you're accepting tons, so the colleagues on this stage, uh, my colleague to my right has accepted lots so, and lots of money from outside DC special interests. Uh, and there have let, been let millions let, and millions of dollars I know that poured into about. this race from outside special interest Mr. groups. Mr. And Amo, I think that's an important Mr. thing Mr. Amo, you came under criticism, I think, from some of Mr. Regenberg's supporters, too, uh, recently about accepting money from uh, certain people or entities with connections to big corporations or fossil fuel. Uh, what's your response to that? And does that mean you're now going to be, be beholden to certain groups? As the son of someone who owns a liquor store that I was at late last night, and the son of a, a nurse who's worked in nursing homes supporting lots of Rhode Islanders through the years, I'm beholden to the values of Rhode Island and that and the people who invested in me to give me the opportunity to serve for the President of the United States. I, my uh, contributions are, are, are things that I'm proud of. People are invested in our campaign. Those attacks come from someone whose father made, father-in-law made the largest corporate contribution in this campaign. So I, I'm not going to dignify that uh, with a response. I, I don't accept the lecturing uh, of folks like that, and I'm going to keep going to Mr. fight for, for Rhode Islanders across the state. Mr. Dickinson, what do you have to say about this issue? Uh, no, again, you're not one of the people who's gotten the big money. These guys are criticizing each other because they think they're each other in the lead. And apparently they don't think I count for much in the campaign because otherwise I'd be getting this criticism. That's great. I'm happy with that. Well, are you getting, my, a, lot of, my are pledge, you getting a lot of money? No, my mm -hmm. pledge is to spend just my own money on the primary, nothing else, and it's the price of a new truck. My old truck's fine. Um, Lieutenant Governor, you've been the beneficiary of the most PAC money in this race. so. What do you say about the role of money in politics in general and, and 
does that jade people and what they think of politicians? I have been the supporter of the groups that represent millions of people that have, want their voices to be heard. People defending women's rights, abortion rights, like Emily's List, or, or in the higher heights. The workers from the labors, uh, the, the um, Layuna, uh, funding from the building trades. That's the so type okay. of support People would that label I have those gotten. as special interests. Well, those are, but they're fighting for the work, for the workers, fighting for the work, everyday people of America. That's the support that I'm receiving, and I'm very proud of that support. Councilman. So I've spent nearly the last decade as a teacher in my community, rooted in community as an elected official as well. I'm not someone who parachuted in from Washington five months ago, and that's an important distinction. I want voters to know that because when people are working for you, it's because they've been on the ground doing the work for a long time. And I can say, look, I grew up poor in the city of Providence as well. So I can also acknowledge that. But, but Mr. Amo, I, we'll, wrap, we'll wrap it up. You said he parachuted. I assume that's what you're talking about. Mr. Amo, did, right, you worked for the White House for two administrations. You've been back and forth and worked in Rhode Island. What do you think about the criticism that, that you haven't been here? And, and I, think, I, I think it's flattering to go over my resume. I've worked for two presidents of the United States. I've worked Is for that, Governor Gina Raimondo here it, at the State House, and I started I started in politics, uh, knocking Is that on the doors experience necessary for, for, for this Sheldon role? White House in 2006. So yeah. I've had a long career. I'm very, it, I'm very, it, I'm very proud of, of all of the it, work that I've done. He needs, Is it, he needs drops, President Biden, more than the Democratic Party. So I guess I, the question I, is, no, 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 do, but do I, you think, have an agenda I think, separate look, from look, that? Look, so this is, this, is, this is very important. So, you know, you can make a claim to fame for, you know, working on the bipartisan infrastructure law, or whatever the case may be. We've been allocating those funds at a local level. The American Rescue Plan Act dollars, I've been on the ground okay. allocating those funds, let Mr. solving Amo issues for, uh, for our Mr. neighbors Amo, on have, the ground. Do, do I think that's an important a, a, an distinction. an agenda of your own to stand on because your commercials and everything else, you tout your experience uh, at the mm -hmm. federal level uh, in the White House. Do you have your own uh, two legs to stand on? Of course. Uh, I am, am, am proud of my work, but I also care deeply about people throughout the first congressional district. When I talk about social security and Medicare, I talk about it from a personal experience. I think about my grandmother who lives in a high rise in Pawtucket. I think about the, the people who have invested in me, my, my teachers, the community. And so my agenda is, has always been about Rhode Islanders and, and I'm we'll, proud to have we'll, served we'll at the we'll, heights of government. We'll finish up here with the Lieutenant Governor. Yes, but he's talking about the, what somebody else did. While he's been uh, talking about that, I really have a record of getting things done. Look at my neighborhood. If you, we can start with uh, looking at the Farm Fresh building, yeah, we went over the Water Fire Art Center. We were sure that we're not going to go through every hundreds, hundreds of units of housing has been built in, right. in, in the community. I, this is real would, things getting things the, done here in Rhode right. Island. We'll not move, just talking about we'll move what on to the next is question. happening in Washington. All right. The governor of Massachusetts recently declared a state of emergency uh, over the influx of migrants uh, and a shortage of shelter space. There's been a similar situation in New York. How would you react if that was happening in Rhode Island? Would you be seeking more federal federal aid for the state or speeding up approval of work permits? How would you handle uh, a situation on the federal level if uh, the folks in Rhode Island were saying we're, we've got a situation here with uh, too many migrants? Uh, we'll start with Mr. Dickinson. Every major city on this planet has an American consulate. Anybody that wants to immigrate to this country can knock on the gate of that consulate. I'd go so far as to give them an airplane ticket if they have a valid case and welcome them here with whatever they need but I'd want to know their name. That's not happening now. And if the Democratic Party fails in the next election, it's because the people of this country are, have had it with that system. They don't like it and they blame us for it. Lieutenant Governor, you immigrated so, to this country? Let me tell you, it's not as easy as you make this sound. In order for my family to come to this country, my mother has to wait 10 years, 10 years, in order to do uh, the immigration process to get here. There are people that have been waiting for years to be able to get uh, their uh, documentation. There are countries right now that lost faith in democracy, that their people are leaving and trying to come to the United States, and that's do, why we have to fight for democracy. But there's more need to be done to control. If we lose faith in democracy, we're gonna, cut, we're gonna run the same um, faith that all this country has do, run. Do, do, does more need to be done, though, to control the flow of migrants at the border, Mr. Amo? Yes, I think that more needs to be done. Uh, I think we need Congress to step up and act. In so many ways, there are, are some actions we can take, whether it's 
uh, setting up additional staffing in asylum courts, whether it's improving processing. Certainly the work permit aspect is so important. When I worked on this issue previously, I talked to mayors across the country who said they just wanted people to have the opportunity to work. And that would revitalize uh, with a lot of the labor de demands that we need and we hear from our employers regularly. Mr. Berberick, you, you work for the military and intelligence. Do you think there needs to be some kind of crackdown on migration into the United States? Look, I, you know, it's disturbing to see what politicians do in using immigrants as political pawns, as for starters. Um, you know, we are a nation of immigrants. My grandfather immigrated from Italy to America in search of opportunity, used that opportunity uh, to serve in World War II and then open our family neighborhood restaurant. So we need to provide those same opportunities for, for future generations. Uh, but we are also a nation of laws and our immigration laws and our immigration systems broken. And so, you know, as in Congress, I'm gonna put a push for bold bipartisan legislation right, that, that provides a pathway to citizenship for the 11 million documented workers, that provides a pathway to citizenship for dreamers. Uh, but if we do that, in order to do that, we've got to bring resor more resources down and more investments into our judicial system, into our law enforcement, while at the same time protecting our border. But if we are really serious about solving this problem, Brian, we've got to do a better job uh, investing and strengthening our relationships with these the countries in Central and South America. Is, where is many a pathway of these unfair are to from. the people who Mr. Dickinson says came here legally, Councilman Gonzalez? So my mom immigrated to the Fox Point neighborhood from the Cape Verde Islands in the 1980s. Both of her parents died. And she wanted a better future for her family. That's what it comes down to. We need to treat our immigrants with dignity and respect. And it's why at the federal level, there are several pieces of legislation that I would actually support. The American Families United Act, the American Dream and Promise Act, the Dignity uh, for Detained Immigrants Act. These are important pieces of legislation that we need to be addressing at the federal level. And ultimately, it comes down to treating our immigrants with dignity and respect. Now, some of these dog whistles that we're hearing from the other side, particularly extremist Republicans around the fact that some of these these folks Let's are unsafe. Those are clearly dog whistles. We need to treat people with dignity and respect, but but simultaneously, I agree with my colleague here. We're going to wrap is, up this topic. There are challenges with things like you know fentanyl getting into our, our cities, and, and we need. We're going to wrap up this that. topic, Lieutenant you. Governor. Do, do you think more federal dollars need to be spent on this? I think some Republicans suggest we should send. Uh, the troops states, into, across the border into Mexico. The states don't have the resources, so the federal government have to help. But what we really need is immigration reform. Every time I work with, I talk to business owners, they're complaining that they have a lack of workers. And there are so many people willing to work that if we could have immigration reform, give them a path to have their documentations in order, we're gonna have a workforce waiting to take on those jobs. We're gonna wrap up uh, that topic right there. We're actually gonna take a quick break right now. We'll be right back with our NBC10 debate for the Democratic candidates in the first congressional primary right after this. Welcome back to our NBC 10 debate. Among some of the Democratic candidates uh, vying to represent Rhode Island's first congressional district in Congress, we had a debate with the other candidates yesterday, 11 in total uh, on the ballot and still in the race. I want to ask a question. I know it's obviously a very heated uh, topic, but I'm looking for a quick answer because I think most of you may be on the same page. Uh, if a vote came up in uh, the House of Representatives to codify the protections that were uh, in Roe v. Wade for abortions that were overturned by the Supreme Court. Uh, would you vote uh, yes or no? Let's start with Councilman Gonzalez. I would vote yes to codify it at the federal level. We also need to repeal the Hyde Amendment and we need to hold radical Supreme Court justices accountable for undermining basic reproductive rights. It's a woman's right to choose. Mr. Berberick, yes or no? 100%, you know, and I will not stop fighting in Congress until Roe v. Wade becomes law of the land once again. Mr. Dickinson, yes or no? This is a very popular issue. I want to say this. The problem is that, we've, that uh, we shouldn't address it in Congress. But we, you got to take we a We should have learned our lesson. It could come up in a vote. I'm what? going to spend my energy talking people out of bringing it up or even discussing it at the federal level. You're not going to, if we do, you're not going to like you, the voters out in, in TV land, you're not going to like the outcome. Yes or no vote? And working no. for you. It's put to, it's put to you. you the Republic, if the Republicans in charge, maybe they go the other way. You got to vote yes or no on abortion it, rights. It doesn't work that way in the real world. And I know because I've been 12 years of legislature. All right. Lieutenant Governor. I have to say, I, I have. We'll come back to you. We'll come back to you. Lieutenant Governor. Can I speak? Yeah. Thank you. 
So I, I have to tell you, I would vote yes. And we have to remember, just in, a couple weeks ago, we have the, another um, a court order that says that medication abortion is, is also on the line. And more than 15% of the abortions that happens in this country is through medications. So yes, we need to make sure that we codify and protect it at the federal level. Mr. Amo. Yes, I would codify, vote to codify Roe at the federal level. And while we look at the, the congressional math, we need to make sure that we fight vigorously against any attempt for a national abortion ban of any sort. And so this is action that we need to take. All right, we're gonna keep this quick. Mr. Gonzalez, did you have a quick well, point? Well, I was quickly. saying with all due respect, the Republicans are peeling back rights every single day in this country. So we need to stand up to that Congress, wholeheartedly. If Congress takes it up that the people we of Rhode Island will be happy with the outcome, yes, I'm not. Yes, we absolutely need, need to codify Roe v. Wade at the federal level so, because if you look at the radical Dobbs decision, that is imminent, and there are millions of women whose lives are on the line. So that's really irresponsible. Lieutenant Governor, again, quickly. I just, I just wanted to say that we have to make sure that it's protected at the federal level. If we leave it a state to state, is that is too dangerous. There are states right now passing legislation in which a doctor has to check with their lawyer before they make a medical decisions about to saving a life of a woman. So no, that has to be done at the federal level. Similar question, uh, assault weapons ban, uh, if it comes for a vote, uh, in the House, Mr. Amo? Yes, yes or well, no? certainly, and there are other actions we need to take. We need to make sure that there are universal background checks across the country. We need to make sure that we are fighting vigorously to, to ensure that the NIH has the resources it, it needs and to combat the public health implications of, of, of gun violence and invest in community violence intervention, which is really important. Mr. Dickinson, assault weapons ban, yes or no? I uh, wish you wouldn't use that word because what I it does- I knew you were gonna bring this up, it but alerts, an AR-15 It type alerts weapon. many, many people that, when they hear that word, which is not the right word because there are no assault rifles. Okay, so we're not they gonna debate what I think that everybody you're trying to do has a common different. understanding. And, it's, and my question is, why weapon haven't we been able to resolve how about this that? problem? How, how about I, if we put it that way? I think the reason we haven't been able to resolve this problem is because we're using the wrong words. We're scaring people about If there's a vote on whether to ban semi-automatic weapons with a detachable magazine, yes or no? I'm sorry, what, say the question. If there's a vote to ban semi-automatic weapons with, for instance, a detachable magazine, something like an AR-15, yes or no? I say no, because I want to know what you mean by something like. There are too many different things. And, and in order to do that, you're going to have to pick up 320 million weapons. Or is and it, if you is try it to pick up 320 uh, million Governor, rifles, yes or you're no. going to fail. And then to Mr. Dickinson's point, I want point, a program is it actually, that's going to work. Is it actually practical if you do ban them to then get them off the yes, street? Yes, of course not. We should it do it. Done. We have done it. In, before, we used to have an, an assault weapon. Uh, ban in this country, and we can go back and do it. And at that time, we didn't have that many incidents of mass shooting. So yes, we have to do Mr. it. Mr. Burbrick. Yes, and I'm, I'm proud to earn the support of Moms Demand Action. And you know, we need to go a few steps further. I think we need to make sure that we, p we pass common sense gun legislation uh, that does three things, as you suggested, but also extensive background checks, red flag laws, uh, we need to entertain the idea of a license, registration, and insurance. We got to think about uh, firearms training and health and a health screening as well, and think about you know raising the uh, the age to 21 across the country for per for the purchase of all firearms. Mr. Gonzalez. Yes. Well, as a fourth grade teacher, I'm tired of teaching my kids about active shooter drills instead of teaching them about multiplication and division. So ultimately, we need to ban assault weapons in this country. More it's mental also health supports too. What was that? More mental health supports too? Absolutely. And it's also, you know, I would go a step further and say we need to stand up to the gun lobby in the NRA because I don't know if you it, saw the news recently, but if you just saw... The NRA doesn't well, like me. Well, 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 well yeah, the NRA, but, but I have, I'm, I'm I glad, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have the me. mom's demand distinction as well. But if we saw what just happened in Jacksonville, that can ha happen in any community. Look at what happened in Uvalde, for example. It's also why I support Gavin Newsom's call to so, have a 28th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution to enshrine basic gun but, safety laws. In, in, thank you, in, Mr. Gonzalez. What else do you do? Uh, apart from, uh, let's put that aside for now, what else do you do? A lot of people are on a college campus. They're concerned about somebody coming in and, and shooting in a classroom or in a dormitory or, or out on campus. Uh, parents, you know, have the same fear sending their little kids to school. What yeah. else do you do? We just saw that happen in, um, in Florida and in North Carolina. As a mother that my son is going into college this weekend, I'm concerned about that. When my daughter goes to school, I don't know when it's going to be the day that they're going to call me and tell me that something happened. We have to make sure that you, we remove guns from our streets. 
remove assault weapons, but also guns from our streets. One of the first things that I had to do as, as elected uh, to the Providence City Council was to organize a visual for a bystander at 12 years old that got shot in a barbecue in front of her house. We have to remove the guns from our street. This is too much. We'll, we'll wrap this up with Mr. Berwick. Yeah, look, I've had a couple of very close personal friends who have died at an early age due to gun violence. And, you know, as a veteran, I understand the re responsibilities that come with uh, handling firearms and assault weapons, I've been trained on them. But I also understand the consequences. And weapons of war have no place on our streets. They belong on our battlefield. All right, moving on. Uh, there was a, plenty of criticism earlier this year from Democrats claiming that Republicans, uh, wanted, including the president, wanted to cut Social Security uh, and Medicare. Um, uh, we touched on a little bit of this on the beginning. What do you tell seniors about what you would do when it comes to Social Security and Medicare? I know some talked about uh, expanding the benefits. Would you even look to lower uh, some of the ages? Uh, let's start with uh, Councilman Gonzalez. Sure. So I support the Social Security Expansion Act, and that's an important distinction because when we look at the cost of living, it's not about maintaining the status quo on Social Security. It's about expanding it. You know, I was just speaking to someone recently in Newport who was telling me about the fact fact that their cost of living is going up and their social security only goes so far. So we need to put those families first. But it's also, I, I think we need to ensure that there's additional tax credits and paid medical leave for families that are trying to assist their, uh, their elderly folks or their parents and, and ensure that they have the resources, both, both at the state and federal level, to, to, to take care of their Again, Mr. Their Amakata, the question is, is, is there enough money in the federal government to, to do these things? We most certainly can do this. I would, on my first day, look to sponsor the Social Security 2100 Act, sponsored by Congressman John Larson of Connecticut. And what this does is it, it works to lengthen the life of Social Security to the year 2100, by raising uh, taxes uh, on on the wealthy, not on not on uh, on on middle class folks, but in increasing the taxes on folks who should be paying more and working to th have those cost of living adjustments made according to the CPI, which would reflect the growing cost that so many of our seniors face. This is something we can do. The, the money is there. You even have Republicans like Mitt Romney who uh, want to shore up Social Security. Mr. Berwick, uh, this is a question, you know, the Republicans claim they don't want to cut it and that's not what they intended, but some of them are willing to sunset uh, some rules. Uh, do, do you buy that argument? Do you think this is an issue that needs to be fought for, or is there bipartisan agreement when everybody says, I'm not going to touch Social Security or Medicare? Yeah, I think actions speak louder than words. I mean, you know, every Rhode Islander deserves a shot at retirement, uh, and no American should ever uh, have to be in medical debt or be denied medical services. And so, uh, you know, I want to focus on real solutions, and I think w some real solutions I think that we can do uh, and that I would call for is increasing the Social Security tax cap. Uh, I think we can also expand Medicare's power to negotiate drug prices, continue doing that. Uh, look at, you know, capping co-pays and, and uh, well, the, the, and and the president well. just announced 10 more drugs that they're going sure, to cap. We need to cap the cost of those. Um, is, is that just to start? Do you start capping other things, too? I just want to go back to the security question. Just yesterday, speaking with some of the, um, the seniors, depending on social security, they were telling me they got an 8 percent increase, but then right there, their housing got increased. So they're basically not getting anything uh, when, with that increase. We have to make sure that we've reformed Social Security. And to your point about Republicans, yes, they're talking about cutting Social Security, but they're using a language They start talking about, oh, maybe we should increase the age to 70. Tell someone that was working in a factory, standing up every day, that they have to wait until 70 until can, they can, can qualify. You lower, can you lower the age, do you think? No. no. We cannot lower the age. We have, to make, lower the we have to make sure that if we have to make sure that we keep it where it is right now, but we cannot allow the Republicans to talk about increasing the age to make sure that that is a way how they're trying to cut Social Security. Mr. Dickinson, is there too much federal spending in that realm? Uh, <clears throat> no, I think we have to fight pretty hard to retain Social Security and, and not fall down, go down the trap of giving people a chance to invest it themselves. That won't work. We really ought to spend, if we have any money in the till at all, it ought to go to universal health care, a very difficult issue. But I want to point something out. This is a, the first opportunity. Uh, Mr. Amo is basically a soldier for Gina Raimondo. Gina Raimondo cut the pension colas for 20,000 retired uh, state employees and teachers. They're suffering today from what amounts to a 34 percent 
drop in the value of their dollar and the legislature in this state won't bring it up because it's being blocked by people working for Gene Raimondo at every level. I know that's a for reference to that, look up anything by Ted Seidel, the <laughs> auditor and the most well-known right. That was done at the state level. I know you think something should be done about it at the I federal level. I absolutely do. I think it's you a did serious work, problem. And I, you did if, work for the former governor who, when she was treasurer. you can talk about treasurer, Social Security and not be aware that there are 20,000 state employees who were promised by contract a pension that was going to not be affected well, by inflation. Let, let's let Mr. Amo answer the question. He worked for former Governor Raimondo, who, when she was treasurer, spearheaded the pension reform. Uh, I know it was a state issue at the time, but do you think that's an issue now with state retirees here in Rhode Island? Yeah, so that was Treasurer Raimondo. I worked for Governor Raimondo. But, okay. but l let me make this... Same policy. Uh, the, I, I would the, assume the, she wouldn't go back on it now. Sure. I, the point that I, I would make here is I think there was a broad consensus that our pension system uh, was uh, occurring, uh, incurring a lot of challenges, uh, was not sustainable for the, the, the state budget. And there was a broad coalition of folks who came uh, to make those changes. That said, I think it's something that state leaders now should look at. If, if, if it is something that, that folks across the state are speaking to, I, I look to the leadership in, in the General Assembly. Lieutenant and the Governor, Governor. That, that, hold on, that, hold on, that, hold on Mr. Dipkin. The, the, the Lieutenant Governor. There is, is only one Gina Raimondo. And you cannot distance yourself from her when she was a treasurer as when she was a governor. It's only one Gina Raimondo. So are you saying so you, you cannot be using her name when it's convenient? So it's not hold, you cannot on, use on, her name when it's convenient to you. So, so are you saying you would have disagreed with that? There was efforts to bring the COLAs, the cost of living adjustments back this year. You're in the administration. That that didn't happen. It didn't happen this time. I'm willing to look at it. If the system is absorbent enough that can do can can be done, I'm open to that idea. With the yes. current players, it'll never happen. Mr. Gonzalez. Yeah, well, with all due respect, I think people are very happy to name drop when it's convenient for them, but they're not name dropping and they're distancing themselves when there's a decision that's made by a leader, uh, a leader who uh, is actually doing something. So look, I'm a legislator. I've been a legislator, and I think the other thing that I want to mention here is it's not just Social Security expansion. We need to look at Medicare for All because our seniors are being price gouged by the pharmaceutical industry. We need accountability Mr. there, Mr. Too. Amo, uh, Councilman Gonzalez's point is, yes, you say I've worked for the Obama administration, the Biden administration, the Raimondo administration, and you support most of those positions. Are you willing to walk away from any, say, nope, those are wrong? No, I'm proud. About, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the Biden administration. Anything you would have been like, uh, no, I don't. I think there's I like some that. things that we could have done more of in, in the first two years that I was there, and I'm hopeful that my colleagues uh, still at the White House and throughout the administration will will do more. And I remain committed to retirement security. It is something that is personal to me when I think about my family and when I think about the st stories of so many Rhode Islanders I've met along the campaign trail and, and beyond. So uh, my commitment to acting at the federal level stands. The, the, the question is, Quickly. who are we going to be working for? Are we going to be working for Washington insiders, or are we going to be working for the people of Rhode Island? And I want the viewers to know that. Uh, Mr. Dickinson, we've gotten some of this a little bit, recently told me that, uh, quote, uh, responsible Democrats today have to preserve the Democratic Party by not letting it be hijacked by progressives. A progressive? This is, this is hold on, uh, we'll get to it. This is a Democratic primary. Uh, we presume mostly Democratic voters, but... Uh, you never know, independence too, uh, in Rhode Island. Um, is the party and some of the policies that we've talked about moved too far to the left for mainstream Rhode Islanders and mainstream uh, Americans? A number of people in this race are kind of running to be the progressive candidate. Mr. Dickinson, I'll start with you because I used your quote. If you could briefly say why you think this is a problem. The problem is that uh, a lot of people who are Democrats, particularly people in unions who probably by tradition are Democrats, are disgusted with the party, and we're going to lose these people if we don't uh, start making some sense. We have the core values. I don't have to tell you what they are, but I think the problem is there is such a thing as a progressive. It's different from a JFK Democrat. In my observation, a progressive calls on your emotions about whatever, and then doesn't have a specific and never looks for a specific solution. We want programs that are going to work. It well, doesn't Mr. matter Burbank, whether it's... Do you think the party is yeah. too progressive? Look, I, I, I'm the only one who's left in this race that is uh, not a career politician and not a political insider. Uh, and look, I'm an American first and a Democrat second. And I believe most of America is down the middle. And, you know, I'm going to, you know, we need a leader in Congress who 
who puts country first, who puts the needs and interests of people before their own self-interest, their own political interests, their own uh, career uh, ambitions, and, and the interest of, of any party. Because at the end of the day, what's needed is we need to compromise and come to common ground for the common good, and that's the only way we're going to progress as a nation. Lieutenant Governor, I, mean, I think you, some of your ads have said you're a progressive candidate. Is that is that fair? Is the party yeah, for a primary you're all trying to yeah, win I'm, that I'm title? Yeah, I'm a proud Democrat. I believe in, in supporting the unions. I believe in a woman's right to choose. I believe in, in uh, abortion rights. I believe in gun safety legislation. So if you want to call me a progressive because of that, yes, I'm a progressive. What we need in Washington is people that are going to be pragmatic, and that's my track record. I have always been pragmatic since the beginning at the local level to get things done for the people that I represent. We need people in Washington that are willing to go and work with everyone, Democrats and Republicans, and get things done for the people. Councilman? Yes, well, I'll say, look, I've got a strong, strong track record. So I represent Ward 1, which is the east side in downtown in the city of Providence. It's the fastest growing ward, not only in the city of Providence, but in the state. Over a thousand residential commercial units that are coming on in the, in the next couple of fiscal years. Over 600,000 square feet in life sciences, uh, a commercial space. Does that work for everybody real, in the district? It does, because it's, it's about real jobs and it's about real economic opportunities and it's about education. But the reason why I've been reliable, effective, and also incredibly, incredibly, uh, incredibly uh, responsive at the local level is because I listen to my constituents, I get stuff done, and when you're an elected official, it's about getting stuff done, and well, I've got a strong sure. track record of that. M Mr. Amo, again, I don't I think President Biden is considered the most progressive Democrat out there. I think progressives have some bones to pick with him uh, as well. Would you call yourself a progressive? Is, are progressives taking the two party too far to the left? No, I, I, I think ultimately Americans and Rhode Islanders want their elected officials and they want their, their party to be working for them, to make government work, to make all of that machinery that, that seems really confusing, all this acronym soup of legislation to actually mean jobs and opportunity for people. So if, if we're talking about progressive in that context, if pro progress means more jobs, investing in health care and making sure we protect our environment, then, then that is something that we should be focused on. Uh, we're getting toward the end here and we, we did ask some of the Rhode Island College students here to to submit questions, and it's actually one I had as well. A, a number of candidates in this race say they'll fight against MAGA uh, Republicans. Uh, with that said, would you be able to work with Donald Trump supporting Republicans in Congress on anything? Um, and real quick, how so? Again, we're getting a little bit short on time, so I'll start with Mr. Amo. I've done it at, at the White House. When we were passing the bipartisan infrastructure law, I picked up the phone and called Republican mayors, Republican governors to get their support, calling their delegations to enact this historic legislation. And so I, I've, I've had a track record of doing it, and I'll continue to do it. Councilman, can you work with... So, so, supporters who maybe think Donald Trump should still be president. So the difference is I've actually been a legislator and I've actually passed legislation. And I think in order to pass legislation, you have to make compromises. If there's a Republican on the other side who's willing to uh, make sure that or work across the aisle, I, I would absolutely welcome that. But we need to stand firm and unequivocal in our values. If there are people who are trying to undermine Rhode Island values, we can't stand for that. Mr. Dickinson. When I first met Joe Trillo, he shook my hand and said, I got to tell you something. I gave Joe Trillo, who ran for governor, to your said. opponent. And I said, Joe, don't worry about that. That's what you're supposed to do. You and I are going to spend the next 18 months working together. And that's what I'll do in Washington. And I'm not going to scare people by using words that they know have no meaning, like assault rifle or weapons of war. Wrong word. You're never going to get anywhere. You're going to have school shootings forever until you stop using the wrong terminology. Lieutenant Governor, I think you've used the term mega Republicans and that you'd fight against them. Can you find uh, any common ground if some of these people think if those are the, the, the election results If those are, are the members that were elected by their constituents for the community, I'm going to work with them because my job in Congress is to work with whoever is there. And I'm going to work with them in immigration reform, gun safety legislation, and protecting abortion rights. So I can work with them. Yes. Mr. Berwick. Yes, look, I mean, I, I I took an oath to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Uh, and I believe the greatest threat to our democracy isn't from abroad, it's from within. Uh, and having spent 10 years in the Navy and another 15 years at the federal level serving under three presidents, both Republicans and Democrats, as a civil servant, uh, I know how to, how to bring people together uh, to, to deliver real results. Do, give me one word to describe Donald Trump. One word, Mr. Burbrick. That's hard. One word. Threat. 
criminal. Indicted. Uh, I'm not making enemies on this platform if I can help it. Uh, That's not my Lieutenant job. Lieutenant Governor? Selfish. Right. How about give me one word to describe supporters of Donald Trump, the former president, who some of whom the next congressperson would represent? One word. Lieutenant Naive. Governor. Naive is what you said? Well, pretty much everybody, including a lot of Democrats and Republicans, are mad as hell, and that's why we have the political outcomes one, that one we have. One word for people who support Donald Trump. People I'm who not, have Donald I'm not Trump flags. Do that because I'm trying to, go, if I get elected and I'm working for you, the people, I'm going to make friends in Washington, and I'm M not Mr. going to show my hand today. Mr. Amo, uh, somebody has a uh, uh, Let's Go Brandon bumper sticker. Uh, we, uh, one word to describe someone like I think they're seeking. I would say that they're, they're important. At the end of the day, uh, they're just like you and I in the end of the day, they're all Americans. And that's, that's the approach that we need to take, that we bring everybody to the table and have those difficult conversations so that we can reach common ground. We wanna end the debate there. We are gonna give you each the opportunity to give a closing statement chosen uh, at random before the debate. So we're gonna say about 30 seconds, try to keep it to the time. We're gonna start with Mr. Burbrick. Look, we have big problems in our country, and we're never going to solve those problems uh, by, if we don't solve our politics, not by sending another political insider, career politician, or extremist to Washington, uh, but by sending a different kind of leader, a leader who understands Washington but isn't beholden to Washington. And I resigned from 15 years of federal service without personal wealth, without political connections, because I fundamentally believe I have an obligation to continue serving and fighting for you, and I'll do that the only way I know how, by listening, by being honest, by fighting for you each and every day, whether you voted for me or not. L Lieutenant Governor Matos. Thank you, thank you for this opportunity. I'm a new immigrant to this country. This is a great nation that gives opportunity to a new wave of immigrants. There's generations before my that were here, came from other, other countries that became an America. This is a great country and it's worth fighting for. It is worth fighting for democracy. It is worth fighting for a woman's right to choose for abortion protection. It is worth fighting for gun safety legislation that protect our children. I'm asking you to vote for me so I can be that voice for Rhode Islanders and for Americans in Washington. Thank you. Councilman Gonsalves. My name is John Gonsalves, and I'm a second-term city councilman representing the east side and downtown in the city of Providence. I'm also a teacher at the Wheeler School and have been a teacher for nearly the last decade. I went from Providence Public Schools to Brown University, but my story shouldn't be the exception. Washington isn't working for us. And quite frankly, I'm tired of the pharmaceutical industry ripping off our seniors. I'm tired of teaching my fourth graders about active shooter drills, again, instead of teaching them about multiplication and division. I hope I can earn your support on September 5th. Please join me at John G for Congress.com. Mr. Dickinson, your turn. Uh, the secret to success is to make friends with everybody in Congress, no matter who they are, find out what they want, and talk to them, bring it back here. Um, I served a couple of years in the Army, eight years total, counting ROTC and reserve time. Um, I have four kids, I have nine grandchildren, I have a big stake in what happens to this planet. And I want to mention one issue that never comes up because it scares the heck out of the people that own the radio stations. We're going to have a nuclear war if we don't face it and deal with it. And that's one of the reasons I'm running. It needs to be talked about. All right, we'll wrap it up there. Mr. Amo. Rhode Islanders deserve a congressperson with the experience to be effective from day one and who shares their Rhode Island roots. I grew up in Pawtucket. I'm the son of two West African immigrants who are hardworking people. My dad who owns a liquor store, my mom who has been a nurse in nursing homes. And because of a community that invested in me, uh, I went from chasing after Ripta to get to school every day uh, to briefing the President of the United States in the Oval Office. I have what it takes to be what Rhode Island needs in their next congressperson. So I humbly ask for your support on September 5th. Thank you to the candidates. That's the end of our NBC 10 debate. The Democratic candidates who are running in Rhode Island's first congressional district in this special election to replace David Cicilline in Congress in Washington. A reminder that we had a debate with the other six Democratic candidates uh, that aired yesterday. You can watch that debate and then this one as well online if you want to compare and contrast their answers, uh, their viewpoints as well. And a reminder, the primary is Tuesday. There's early voting as well. We also want to thank uh, our friends here at Rhode Island College and our partners with the American Democracy Project. Again, thank you very much for joining us here on NBC 10.